So at this year, uh, it's from Political Economy, Southern Africa, uh, Research Think Tank. And she believes political economy in Africa, uh, I think they will go globally as time goes. And then we have Housing Tangeni, uh, she is the marketing and PR. And marketing and development. Marketing and development, okay. At this year, we'll, we'll take the manager, director, yes, and the So you will, you will present yourself afterwards. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? Good, thanks. So my name is Pia. I'm the director at Political Economy Southern Africa. We're a political economy think tank focused on regional integration in the SEDEC and Africa more broadly. And so a lot of the work we do uh, fits within three streams of our expertise, economic research, government relations, and public policy and advocacy. And as the lecture goes by, you'll see where or how we understand. So today's lecture is, is, is focused specifically on introducing you to political economy as an analytical tool, as a framework for understanding the world and also the topics that you're discussing, globalization and regionalization, or regionalism, in other words. Um, so, I'll start off with a brief overview of today's lecture. So, we'll start off by defining what we mean by politics, what we mean by economics, and then going through a brief summary of how these two academic or intellectual fields have developed over time and where we are currently, and focusing specifically on their fundamental philosophical basis, because it all starts with a philosophical basis, which then informs your sort of theoretical framework, which is then tested against the reality that happens in the world, both economics and political reality. Then we'll go through a history of political economy, uh, and then look at different approaches to political economy. Because although the general field is considered global or international political economy, there are actually various forms of political economy analysis that form part of a broader uh, body of work considered either as varieties of capitalism or even political economy, if you might, as a, you know, a theoretical body of work. And then we'll look at some of the contemporary issues within political economy. So what are political economists looking at? What are they discussing? What are the most important things being evaluated currently? And then we'll look at why do we even want to do political economy analysis? Why is this even important uh, in today's world? So we'll start off by defining politics and economics. So, Politics, although you might find different definitions of what exactly it is, primarily it's a study of state and power, its source, that's what you look at when you're talking about legitimacy, when you're talking about the source of the authority that people have, and its distribution. That's what we look at when we're trying to understand the spheres of government, the division of power, and you know, unpacking how the constitution separates power between a administration, a cabinet, and a legislation, or legislature in this tricameral arrangement that we have in South Africa. So it's, main, it's mainly about understanding how the state, and by state, I don't just mean sort of government in the sense of national department of water, or the department of trade and industry. We also mean, across the board, other agencies and apparatus of the state. So the state includes the police, the state includes the military, the state also includes agencies that encourage development, your national youth development agencies and the like. And so politics is primarily about understanding the state and power, its sources, distribution and how it's maintained. Economics on the other hand is the study of resource utilization. How do we use the resources? And how do we grow these resources and how do we distribute, how do we share these resources? And if you just think of these two fields, you'll realize that they're inevitably interlinked, right? 
Because if you're talking about state and power, that power is exercised over subjects, right? Which determines how you know people have access to land, for example, through the laws. How people are either wrong or doing something illegal or doing something legal, right? And so this is also about how people can utilize the resources as well. So the utilization, so the study of power affects how we distribute and use resources and also resources, the final distribution of resources, affects who has power. So it's quite common that you know, you'd understand people with power, or people with money rather, have got some sort of political power, even if they're not politicians, right? Um, you might think that uh, someone like Patrice Putzi has got you know, limited access to Silver Ramaphosa, but he's got much more money here than any of us, and so as a result of his influence, economic influence, he has more access to political power. And it's that relationship that we try to understand with political economy. And political economy then is about understanding the correlation and the relationship between these two fields, which some people consider as separate and should not be considered as one, whilst other people, you know, political economists generally, would say the two are not separated, you can't separate the two. It's your ability or influence in terms of power that determines your ability to access resources, it influences your share of the resources, and that share of the resources also influences the amount of power that you have. And so it's some sort of virtual cycle where the one impacts on the other. So, again, this view is juxtaposed, as I mentioned, between people who see these fields as separate, politics on the one hand, economics on the one hand, and people who see them as interlinked. And at the center of this is a theoretical basis of how people understand the world, right? So the mainstream versus the heterodox. The heterodox is you know, the people who say, politics and economics are interrelated, you can't separate them. The mainstream are the people who say, actually economics is separate from politics, they shouldn't mix, you should reduce the influence of government, you should let markets be unregulated, you should let the economy effectively determine its own efficiency and distribution. Right? So these are two different sides of the same type of debate and understanding you know, natural phenomena or human phenomena. Right? And on the one hand there's deductive theories, and these are theories uh, that are the foundation of people who see politics and economics as separate. Deductive theory says that all, for example, if you look at economics uh, for those mainstream views who say, actually everyone is self-centered, everyone is going out there to maximize what's good for themselves, and that is considered you know, the, founding, uh, the founding assumption of human behavior. And then the rest of the world is then understood through this lens. So what you do with deductive theories is that you have a specific standpoint which you take as sufficiently evident that you don't have to justify it or you don't have to disprove it. The fact that people say everyone is selfish. But, and they'll say even if people help someone else, it's usually in order to satisfy a selfish desire that they have. And so these people are not willing to accept that people are either egoistic, selfish and self-centered, or altruistic, helping other people, right? And this is the fundamental the basis on which they understand the world and the basis on which economics is built on in the mainstream. However, this is you know, juxtaposed with um, inductive theories, right? These are theories that say, actually, people are different. You can't say that everyone is selfish. There are some people who are selfish. There are some people who are you know, less selfish or more people orientated. And actually, it either depends on the context that the people are in, or it depends on you know, the nation uh, values that, are, you know, that govern people's behaviors. And so this type of theory is not based on a central assumption of human behavior. They are based on what is empirically there, what we can see. And so these are based to say people behave this way in this context. And so the theories of inductive, so inductive theories are not general theories. They are theories that apply to specific contexts and may be applied to many contexts, but by and large are not considered to be all-encompassing type of theories because 
as you explore and as you gain more evidence, the theory itself is supposed to change. It's supposed to be flexible enough to accommodate the new evidence that comes about. So what is the history of political economy? So political economy fits into the inductive theories. If we look there, uh, what you have are the inductive theories is Kantianism. So the, so the basis of the mainstream view of the deductive theories come from the success of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a philosophical um, perspective that says what is good is what creates the most utility for the most number of people, right? And there are different variations of utilitarianism. There are those who are hedonistic, who say whatever feels good is what's good. I'll do what's good, do me, do you type of, uh, you know, moral framework. This is all based on the moral framework. It might be economics, but primarily because you engage with other people, it is informed by your moral framework. And so the deductive theories will say, actually, people have rational expectations, right? And these rational expectations are based on what's good for themselves. So I'm always, as a deductive, in the deductive mainstream view of economics, I'm always trying to satisfy my self-interest. If I am if I'm negotiating with a friend or doesn't even need to be a friend, I will always try to get one up on someone else, ultimately. So I'm always trying to maximize my utility and whether the, the, where we then agree or disagree is often where we cannot ex, we cannot improve our own utility without damaging the other person's utility. That's where we get areas such as Pareto optimality, which says people will negotiate, negotiate until the point where they cannot, either one of them, cannot improve their position without damaging the other person. So for example, you might think of an instance where you're shopping in, you know, small street or whatever, and you're negotiating with a Pakistani shop owner on the price for good. You will only agree at the point where you feel you've got the best bargain and they feel that they're making enough profit from the sale. If you increase your bargain, that decreases their profits. As a result, then you disagree. And this is what the whole notion of rational expectation is about, is that people will agree at that point where they cannot individually improve their position without you know, uh, disadvantaging the other person. And this is the foundation of most economic theory that you will study, say, first-year economics, right? Where they teach about supply and demand. Because this is the mainstream view, um, it's been you know the view that's been most published. It's become the view that you know informs whether it's the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, whether it's company CEOs, and even to some extent government uh, officials. And so this is the view that you will be studying the most. However, there is an alternative view, the political economy view, or the heterodox view that you know argues against some of these assumptions. And so from this, they then aggregate to create the supply-demand analysis, which is a framework that says, from all of these individuals who are going about life trying to satisfy their own needs, and you know, at some point you meet someone, you negotiate, you get to a point, your benefits, you know, you're happy with your benefits, they're happy with whatever they're getting out of the engagement, and that type of engagement is what they understand to make up the economy, which is then aggregated into the framework which they teach called supply and demand theory. So, for instance, what they always teach in first year economics is that when demand goes up, the price goes up. And that is based on all of these assumptions which are aggregated into the supply and demand framework of analysis. And this then forms the foundation of microeconomics, forms the foundation of macroeconomics. This is then juxtaposed with inductive theories. Remember, inductive theories aren't those that assume a certain human behavior. They say, in this context, this is how we observe people to behave, and this is what we draw from this engagement, and if you want to change human behaviors, you need to do A, B, C, D. So these are inductive theories. So, Kant is a German, German philosopher, uh, well known for his two maxims. So he, he was on a, uh, a philosophical inquiry of trying to discover what is good, as philosophers always do. And 
his theorems are that you don't want to do that which you don't want to be done to you. Right? So that's his first maxim. That's just a highly summarized version of it. And it makes sense, right? Remember, all of this starts from a moral basis. You know, on the one hand, whether the doctor says everybody's selfish, so I'm also selfish. And everything that's good is only that which you maximize as an opportunity. But you know, Kant on the other hand says, no, actually, what's good is that which you are willing to be, accept to be done to you. And then there's a second maxim that says, in whatever that you do, you should not prohibit your ability to do that and apply it universally. Right? And what this means is that you can't now, uh, because uh, you're dealing with a friend or a family member, have a specific moral basis that applies to them and have a separate moral basis when, for example, you're dealing with your neighbor from DRC or Rwanda. Uh, the idea here is to say, you do what you would accept done unto you, but you need to also, so how you test in each and every situation whether you're doing what's good is whether you can do this to everybody else in the world effectively. So this is the sort of, this is the central moral theory, moral framework that informs inductive theories, that informs political economy, that informs heterodox views on the political economy uh, dichotomy. And so these are also views that permeate in other types of philosophy such as feminism. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of us have uh, come across feminism or know at some level that even the most diluted tenets of feminism the idea that men and women are equal and that they, you know, the whole political and economic systems need to cater to the unique needs but also not discriminate against men and women. So this is also based on this notion of Kantianism as a central moral framework that allows you to understand the world in a specific way. So this is also the basis for applied ethics, right? So ethics being what I call the moral basis for the economic framework and typically these are the views that are applied in sort of examples such as human resource ethics cases, legal ethical cases, etc. Some of these principles are central in those areas as well. So these are principles that inform politics and economics only. They also inform other parts of the world as we know it. And the idea here is to say that you're an individual, but you are part within a specific community that informs your behavior. For example, you don't behave the same way amongst your friends as you would in church. You don't behave the same way amongst your family as you would, say, on a Friday afternoon watching a sports match. So these types of contexts also frame your behavior. And so the idea here is methodological holism. What that means is, we're not trying to analyze an individual unit as we did with the deductive theory, which looks at the human and the individual level. We are trying to understand the system and the structural framework with which people find themselves in and understand their human behavior within that framework. And so this is critically what differs between these theoretical pieces, inductive, deductive, and these are what informs whether you political economy or economics separate from politics. So now I want to get into the history of political economy. So political economy for most people, so firstly, by show of hands, how many people have heard of political economy or even what we're discussing today, just by show of hands? Nobody's heard of political economy. Nobody's read your course reader. Alright, so political economy is not a new phenomenon, it's not a new type of analysis, it's always been there. And <clears throat> in many ways, it's always been a sort of clash between the mainstream and the heterodox. And a lot of this is also informed by sort of your class position, etc. You know, for example, an example that most of you might be able to relate to, in Parliament, when debates about land come up, you always see a clear difference between the views that the democratic alliance is expressing, which are largely liberal views, which form part of a mainstream in terms of 
their rhetoric is equal opportunity, etc., compared to the EFF's rhetoric, which is much more informed by sort of Marxist analysis of class and power, and the idea that the state should be the central body within the economy determining the distribution of income, etc. And so these views, you know, whether you sit on a mainstream or heterodox, is also informed by your current class position. And so now what we're going to go through is sort of the history and how it developed. So in the West, you know, what we consider Europe and North America, the history of political economy is based on, it was founded on Adam Smith's theories when he's writing about wealth, the wealth of nations. So for those of you who are interested and in, who are mainstream economists, this would be a book I would recommend all of you to read, even if you're not interested in because it goes to show uh, the fact that you cannot actually separate politics and economics despite mainstream economics founding itself on Adam Smith's theories. Adam Smith was primarily trying to understand how countries and nations build their wealth, but also at the same time was in a way trying to justify the colonial process of saying states gain wealth from productive use of land, this then justifies the colonial experience of North America through Columbus because the Red Indians were not productively using the land. So when you understand these theories and how they're taught, it's not simply a way of understanding the world, it's also in many instances used to justify a political position or reinforce an economic position that people have. So, then we move from Adam Smith to David Ricardo. So there was an era where there was no free trade. So it was mercantilist trade. The idea with mercantilist trade is that you run shipping routes and at the harbor of each place, so Cape of Good Hope or uh, wherever, um, Dar es Salaam on an East African shore. The idea is that at that border, all the goods that were exported Ported across the seas would then get taxed, and inevitably this led to tax wars. Currently, what you're hearing about in the case of the US and the aluminium and steel tariffs that they've increased. So the states decide on all aluminium and steel imports, we're going to charge us increased tax at this level, and the European Union, which exports a lot of steel and aluminium to the US, applies a similar tax because if they don't apply the tax, that means that U.S. goods will be cheaper for their consumers, and so the, US, the European consumers will end up importing from the U.S. And so this whole fight with these tariffs is what led to trade wars. And so come Ricardo, who then tries to try and understand what is the basis or justification to encourage free trade? How can we get countries to stop fighting over trade routes, stop fighting over monopolies on commodities, but to encourage them to trade freely. And he comes up with a concept called comparative advantage. And he says countries trade because countries have a comparative advantage. Each country has something that it's good at, and it produces that. And this then is used as a foundation to encourage free trade and say, look, if you are good at creating cheese, you'll find a country that's good at making wine and you'll exchange, everybody's happy. Everyone's having cheese and wine. So this was then the foundation for encouraging countries to trade freely, which then becomes the, you know, the central theoretical basis for organizations such as the World Trade Organization, etc. Yeah, so do you mean if, when you say uh, free trade, Yeah, so similar to what's happening currently with the continental free trade area, the idea with that is we're no longer going to be charging tax on goods that are coming from other African countries, right? So as countries trade and import, SARS is right there at the border of customs and they're stamping, seeing what is being imported and there's a book of tariffs that says if you're importing a vehicle engine, this is how much you pay. If you're importing a necklace, this is how much you pay. And so this is what happens in the day-to-day -day if countries trade with one another. And so free trade then starts off by reducing all those tariffs, 
sometimes to zero, or sometimes as low as possible. With some goods, you can't not tax them because they are critical goods. You might think of oil, for example. It's unlikely that oil will not be taxed because a lot of governments rely on tax revenues from oil in order to sustain themselves, such as Angola. And what that does is when you remove the taxes, and that makes the goods cheaper. So now, when you're paying 12 rand on a loaf of bread that you imported from Botswana, you're now paying 10 rand, for example, because the tax is reduced to zero. And then there are more advanced levels that you want to do in terms of the integration process. So it starts off with tariffs, which makes things cheaper, but then you want to also build roads and rail infrastructure to connect the country so that you can be trading. Because without roads and without connecting infrastructure, it doesn't matter that you've got zero tariffs. And so that's the current process that the continental free trade areas go towards, and African countries are now effectively trying to emulate what's happening in the European Union, where countries and people, goods, move freely within the Union, and people can move without uh, having to worry about visas, etc. So, we move now from Ricardo, and Ricardo is, if I'm not mistaken, in the 18th or 17th century, when this is happening. And later on comes Marx, who says, well, the biggest fundamental thing you've missed in all of this is to say, countries must trade freely, you know, and we can colonize people because they're not using the land productively. By the way, this is the same argument being used in today's land reform question. And he says, well, this is rubbish. You guys are effectively exploiting labor. And actually, the economy is made up of labor and capital. And then, this is your class position between capitalists and labor determines your power, determines how much you will earn from your labor, determines a whole lot of things. So for example, Karl Marx says there is a the exploitation of labor is necessary in order to maintain a system of profit, right? So if you ask yourself, what is profit, right? Profit is the fundamental thing that you know, mainstream economists take as it's a given, right? Nobody's going to exchange unless there's a profit, the, the motivation to exchange. But the profit is actually stolen in a way, according to Marx, or exploited from the worker, right? So if you think of it, if you work in a factory, to make Nike sneakers, right? You make this Nike sneaker, uh, eight or 12 hour day shifts, the sneaker gets sold, right? You get paid maybe $1 a day, $10 a day, if you're lucky. But the sneaker gets sold for 250 US dollars at the retail store. And so there's this huge profit in your labor, according to Marx, so there's a labor theory of value. Now this is fundamental because previously there was no theory of value, right? In the mainstream approach, value is simply asserted by your individual taste, right? If you are willing to pay 10 rand for this mouse, someone else might be willing to pay 50 rand based on what they attach the value of this mouse to. But Karl Marx says, no, actually, there is a labor theory of value, that when workers work, they put value into what they produce. And the value is literally what it retails for. So when you work in an eight hour shift in a Nike factory, making the sneakers, and suddenly that gets retailed for $250, the value you create is $250. But the value you receive is your wages, which might be $1 a day, $10 a day. And so effectively what capitalists do is they exploit labor, in order to extract that profit from labor. And this is the fundamental critique in the 20th century in terms of economics, and it then informs a whole lot of it, even today. It's a fundamental uh, you know, politics or perspective that informs the EFF, for example, and a lot of political movements. Then, you know, the progression of this you know, moves on, and you, know, you have the First World War, you have the Great Recession in the 1918s, and then this whole group of what is referred to as the marginalists approach the topic of economics. And actually, 
Marx and he had come up with a whole theory of how you can calculate the labor theory of value and it was all mathematical. Prior to Marx, a lot of these were philosophical arguments which had no tangible numbers or quantifiable um, framework to understand these things. And so what Marx contributes is a way to measure what is exploited from labor, to measure what is the value that is created. And so the marginalists, Walrus, Gibbons, and Menor, come along and they critique Marx and say, actually, um, <coughs> what you have is wrong. You have now mixed uh, politics with economics, and politics is not a science, it's purely an art. And what you need to do is make economics more scientific. And they're then the ones who develop the current um, supply demand theory framework, the ISLM framework, and all these kind of current tools that are used in mainstream economics in order to understand uh, economics. But primarily what they were undermining was this notion of the exploitation of labor by capitalists and saying, actually, labor comes to the, gets a job and it's you know, voluntary. Nobody forces you to get a job. So this can't be exploitation because you choose to be in that job. You are aware when you sign your work contract, you know how much you get paid, you know how much if you're on a commission structure, how much value you must pay in order to get whatever commission you get. And so they argue that actually it's still all about utilitarianism. Everybody's not there to maximize their own interests. The capitalist on the one hand is maximizing his interest and they justify the profits based on the fact that the capitalist brings capital goods to the labor market. They bring the factory, they bring the machines, and workers simply bring their labor. And so their justification is that you cannot get more value from your labor because you don't have the capital, you don't have the factory and the machines. All you have is your manpower. And ultimately then, <coughs> ultimately then becomes the success of utilitarianism and the mainstream over political economy from that point onwards. And ultimately uh, what they begin to do is to quantify Max's economics and develop a supply demand theory and then move from their micro analysis of human behavior and create a macro analysis through uh, the aggregation of human behavior at an individual level. And that then forms the basis of macroeconomics. But although the mega and the marginalists never would consider themselves as political economists, by asserting a specific human behavior, in my view, is to assert a political position, is to assert a yeah, effectively a political position on someone. And so, in my view, they are also part of the evolution of political economy. And effectively, after the marginalists, what you have is a economics imperialism. Then what becomes, you know, what becomes of the whole sphere of politics and economics is that economics takes over, political phenomenon becomes explained through economic theory. I'm sure some of you might have heard the resource curse or the Dutch disease, which says that if countries have a star commodity like oil, they will get caught up in trying to extract the most value from oil such that other sectors will be neglected. An example of this might be Angola, where the country is pretty much close to zero domestic manufacturing capacity. They export oil, they get dollars, very wealthy country, but everything else that consumers use is important from the rest of the world. And that is what is considered the Dutch disease. But obviously you can see this undermines a whole lot of countries who have commodities. Botswana, for example, with diamonds, who's been able to use diamonds in order to develop and improve the standards of living, improve the governance, and everything else, despite having the wealth of resources that they have. And so this economic imperialism overlooks a lot of the contextual issues around the nature of the state, the nature of power, which ultimately is about politics. 
And this leads to a critique that says, actually, you cannot model, say, criminals' behavior by the fact that um, through an economic framework. There are just certain things that cannot be understood through economics alone. And in fact, what you need is a combination of understanding the politics as well as the economics. So the example I make of Angola as well as Botswana on the issue of the, the resource curse or the Dutch disease is a case in point. And this results in a body of work referred to as a variety of capitalism, which ultimately is a reincarnation in a way of political economy. Varieties of capitalism says, capitalism takes different forms depending on the context that it's in. In China, for example, most people would say uh, the Chinese state is a communist state, but if you look at and analyze the way in which the economy functions, you'll realize it's a mixed economy, yes, with a strong state that drives economic development, but primarily that is still part of capitalism, which is vastly different from what you observe in the US, for example. And so capitalism has these differences depending on where you are, and that's the fundamental thrust of the varieties of capitalism. And so then, <coughs> and so what I've gone through now is a sort of transition from the West in terms of the evolution of political economy. In the East, this was also there, but informed by a different set of uh, processes. So still linked to Marxism, but primarily driven by communism. In the East, what you have is Chairman Mao in China, Lenin in Russia, who have these series of socialist experiments. Now, socialist and communist society is based on the government being the central institution driving development. Whereas the capitalist society says individuals, companies, firms, the market is what drives development. And a communist and a socialist would say government is what drives development at a national level. And so what we have with Chairman Mao and Lenin are these socialist experiments in order to drive development, especially coming out of the Second World War, and try and develop into what the countries are now. And this is then juxtaposed with the story of how political economy evolved in the West. So currently now we have what is referred to as political economy, which is primarily a study of the balance of power and how that influences the distribution of resources and how the ultimate distribution of resources influences the balance of power. So there are multiple definitions of what exactly political economy is, but by and large, political economy is a study of an evaluation about this. So how does that distribution of power influence the distribution of resources? How does that ultimate distribution of resources then impact on the balance of power? And it takes an inductive reasoning approach, as mentioned. It doesn't assume a certain type of human behavior, but formulates a framework of understanding human behavior in a specific context. Whether that be feminism, whether that be international political economy, whether that be structuralist or Keynesian economics, which are all variations of the political economy, ultimately what they're trying to do is understand a structural uh, framework that explains human behavior in a specific context. And as mentioned, the approach is methodological holism, the idea that it's not the individual that determines what the macroeconomy and the, you know, the country is like, it's actually at a national level that constraints and defines human behavior, which then also you know, influences the individual in a certain way, but the individual themselves also has an impact on the actual structure. So for example, you might think of um, an example, people growing up in broken households or people growing up with single parents. Ultimately, they also face a decision and in, as to whether they're going to continue along the path they took or change in terms of their life, whether they're you know, going to have a happy family and marriage, or whether they're going to continue down the road, broken path, or whatever. 
ultimately everyone, even people from you know what you consider normal households, also ultimately face that decision as you grow up. And ultimately then, what we're saying is your family structure informed who you are, informed what you think is good or what you think is appealing, but also your own decisions then have an influence on the entire family structure itself. And so there's a dialectical approach rather than say human behavior is all self-serving, aggregate this, get the back recovery. So there are various forms and approaches to political economy, and I've listed just a few. Uh, so Keynesian economics is an economics brought about by John Maynard Keynes, an English economist, and he was writing at the time of the Great Depression in the early 1900s, 1918, for coming to stay here. Um, and his point was to try and analyze what role the state can play in smoothing economic cycles. Right? It was taken as, you know, for granted that economies go through cycles. There's a recession, there's the boom. And so economies go through the cycle. And so Keynes tried to explain that actually government has an influence to smooth that cycle, right? If governments can increase spending during economic recession in order to boost domestic or aggregate demand, that will smooth the cycle. And if then they do austerity during a boom, that will then you know, curtail issues such as inflation that result from the boom. And so his main uh, assertion was that what role can government play in sweeping business cycles and economic cycles? This obviously is important to the Great Depression, given that it was a you know, multiple years recession and it was just a devastating time to be living. Similarly to what we experienced after the 2008 global financial crisis. Um, so these ideas are still very relevant, but obviously they have a specific context with which they are applied. Then you get what is referred to as structural economics. Structural economics was mainly developed by Latin American economists, and they were trying to understand how Latin American economies are integrated in the global economy after being colonized. And obviously, this applies to African economies just as much as Latin America, because we're also former colonies. And what they tried to understand was how do we get former colonial countries to move out of this dependency where they're exporting raw materials to their former colonizers in order to import manufactured goods? And so ultimately the problem they tried to solve is the progress from uh, of what is referred to as import substitution industrialization. Big words. All it means is how do we move from exporting raw materials to beneficiating in order to export manufactured goods rather than exporting raw materials and importing manufactured goods from the rest of the world. And there are various problems that they um, encountered through this process, such as shortages of foreign exchange, etc. Because ultimately, if you think of Angola, how would Angola industrialize? Inevitably, it needs to export less oil and pump in a lot of the revenue into developing factories and industry so that it can export manufactured goods. But in so doing, they would lose a great source of foreign exchange because they currently are exporting oil, which accounts for 90 to 95% of total export earnings. So if they must reduce the oil export, they're going to reduce the amount of dollars they get. When you reduce the amount of dollars you get, you end up creating a black market for exchange, end up having to depreciate your currency because the dollars become more expensive given the scarcity. And what the structuralists were trying to understand is how can countries avoid that problem but also encourage themselves to industrialize so as to move out of the structural position they find themselves after being colonized. Then you get institutional political economy. Institutional political economy tries to look at the influence of institutions on economic outcomes. Institutions are anything from formal and informal rules that define human behavior. So for example, you might think of an informal rule as you don't make a noise in church. Right? You don't 
you know, talk to your friend whilst someone is lecturing in a lecture hall, for example. These are all institutions, they may not be codified, written in the university rules or, you know, written above the altar at the church, but people adhere to them and it, you know, it drives human behavior. On the other hand, we've got very formal rules, such as laws, do not steal, do not murder, that define human behavior and actually you know, influence you to act in a certain way. And so, uh, what institutional political economists try to do is to understand what are these institutions and how do they affect economic outcomes. You hear a lot about corruption, for example. And corruption is one of the areas that institutional political economists have focused on. To say, here is what we call patronage, clientelism, etc., and rent seeking. How does that impact on economic development? So, for those of you who are interested in these kinds of questions, you should be reading up on these institutions. Uh, you know, the famous people there are Thorsten Veblen, who talks about conspicuous consumption. And he really starts to inform, even today, marketers on how humans behave. That humans' consumption is driven by two things, assimilation and differentiation. Assimilation is, you know, when everybody's got a certain checkered shirt, everybody's got it, right? Because it looks cool on your friend, you also want to buy it, go and buy it, everyone. Next thing, the whole neighborhood's wearing the same shirt. On the other hand, you have consumption driven by differentiation. And these are the people who will rock up at lectures with Louis Vuitton bags, Chanel gloves, etc. And for most econo economists, this doesn't make sense because why would you pay 10 times more for a set of gloves than, that don't warm you any better than, you know, Pep's pair of gloves. Uh, and ultimately, if you are a self-interested human being, you should be warmed, you should be going to buy the Pep gloves if that's what you're after, right? You're getting the most value, getting the warmth just as much as your Chanel gloves. But people will end up buying Chanel gloves because this allows them to differentiate themselves from other people. And so he talks about this called conspicuous consumption, which for the mainstream economists cannot be explained. You know, why do people wear Cavella shoes? Why do, you know, all these conspicuous consumption that people engage in. And so these are also some of the institutions that institutional political economists try to understand. Then you also have developmental state theory. Now developmental state theory uh, emerges from Southeast Asia experience post post-colonization. And the first country was Japan. So post Second World War, Japan is devastated. There were two nuclear bombs dropped on it. Um, it's a small little island state, two islands, population of about 13 million, and they literally had to pull themselves by their bootstraps. Currently, top five economy globally, I think it's the third or the fourth biggest economy. Um, you know, for a small island state that you know is exporting all its goods globally, um, you know, doing much better off than a lot of countries that you know. If you compare uh, other African countries, you know, Ghana, for example, you know, endowed with minerals, etc., much bigger population, you know, that should be performing much better, but isn't performing better. So they try to understand what was unique about these Southeast Asian states. Indonesia is one of them, China is one of them currently, and Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. And these are considered the newly industrialized states because prior to Second World War, the industrialized states were England, were America. And back then, you'd get goods, and they all had stamps made in England, made in North America, made in Canada, etc. Now, all you get is made in China. These are the industrialized, newly industrialized countries. And so, developmental state theory tries to then say, these are the factors that the government needs to have in place in order to direct development. The government needs to be strong, so it must have a clear, strong path that it needs to take, right? It must have a development plan that it needs to implement. It must be a strong state that is capable to define human behavior and consolidate everyone's behavior towards this national agenda. It must also be insulated from private interest. You can't have a developmental state if you're going to be captured. 
You can't have a developmental state if you're going to be serving private interests. You need to serve national interests. And so the developmental state theory then tries to map out what is needed for a government in order to drive development, like the Southeast Asian states. <coughs> then there is a value chain in economics. And this develops out of understanding that actually over the years production has changed, right? We come from a post-World War II era, pre-1970s era, where all the goods were made in one country. You know, you had your stamp made in England, made in China, etc. But now, production is actually arranged over multiple countries, right? And it's arranged in global and regional value chains. So, yes, China exports a lot of goods to the rest of the world, and they all come with a stamp made in China. But a lot of the parts aren't actually made in China. And China's greatest success has been because it is able to assemble all the goods that are made in neighboring countries. Your Taiwan's, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, that all made chips, that all made PC boards that are then assembled in China as smartphones and exported to the rest of the world. So the global value chain approach is this understanding that actually countries are no longer trying to produce a good in one country. They are trying to integrate themselves in these global and regional value chains. And so how do we then allow countries to develop given that uh, development happens over multiple countries? Now this creates a serious problem for policy makers, right? Because in the past, what you'd be able to do, for example, in South Africa, if you're trying to develop the water industry, car manufacture, you'll have high tariffs for car imports, right? What that does is, in, you know, pre-1995, tariffs on cars were over 150%, right? So you're importing a car, you're going to pay a massive tax, which makes it expensive. What that does is it makes you look for local cars. And what you wanted to do then was to say, okay, those guys who are producing cars in South Africa, we're going to give you these incentives to enable you to you know, produce cheaper, excuse me, employ more people and wrap up your production. But now, because countries are importing from you know, engines from Brazil, seats from Botswana, uh, frames from Europe, that means that huge parts of the value chain where we have the most value, where we as South Africa want to create value, are not located in South Africa. And so those incentives end up getting wasted because our employees end up assembling goods that are produced elsewhere. And the value, because we import those goods, goes to those countries rather than South Africa. And so without understanding where the value chain is located, the government could be offering incentives and not getting the value that it should be getting. And then there's the feminist economics. And as mentioned, this is primarily about understanding how gender relations determines the distribution of resources and power between men and women. And uh, ultimately, um, it's also about recognizing the production that women uh, contribute to the economy that's unmeasured. So for example, good the GDP numbers are primarily an aggregation of sales and exports that happen in the country, right? This is that every factory that pays tax to SARS, SARS then collects how much money this company claims to have made, and the, those numbers are what become GDP effectively. Obviously there's some manipulation in terms of uh, removing double counting, etc. But ultimately that's what happens. But women who work in the, in the household don't have pay first for the work they contribute, whether that be bringing up children or even cleaning the house. And there's a whole lot of labor that goes unmeasured that effectively women contribute freely towards the economy. And so feminist economists are trying to grapple with these issues and also try and understand how the value created by a woman can be measured, how women can get more equitable income from the same kind of work that they do in comparison to their income. Question? Uh, I, I think uh, in the course of the week, I had something that said uh, pertaining to development in Africa. If there were, if the, the former colonial powers way to remove debt, there's this foreign debt which was accrued 
through the process of decolonization. So I want to understand uh, how far is that being a reality where they say all foreign debt is being swept off, and then you spoke on the development state or to understand the sort of and industrialized or so. Lastly, on women and feminist uh, theories, uh, what do women have, or what have women identified as, for instance, my wife is not working, she's a housewife, uh, how does that effort that she contributes, how do we calculate it? With it? So, uh, how is it a reality that it is being considered when we calculate our GDP? So I'll start off with your first question around debt. So African countries get a lot of debt relief, and obviously, depending on the sustainability of the debt, this is when donors will either come to the table or wait and see how things will happen. So for example, Mozambique recently had a $2 billion debt scandal. Effectively, what happened there was there were government loans which were taken on by government agencies, uh, pro-indicas, other institutions, uh, which then were used, you know, corruption, uh, there were, you know, monies that were given to officials, there were guarantees that the government signed or that officials signed on behalf of government that were illegal, and ultimately this was not declared as part of the debt that the country has. What we've seen over the last two years is when this became true, donors then removed, cut all of the aid and all of the funding that they were sending to Mozambique, Mozambique's debt to GDP shot up from 60% of GDP to where it is currently at around 128% of GDP. And now what that does is it becomes more expensive for uh, Mozambique to service its debt. I mean, countries are pretty much similar to human beings. If you accrue debt that you cannot sustain, ultimately you won't have money to even buy your daily items. And so the cost of servicing that debt increases. And this is the point at which then donors are willing to give debt relief. But typically the debt relief doesn't come in the form of monies to the government. It either says that we'll give you this debt relief if you implement this type of financial improvement program. So what donors want is to make sure that if we give you this debt relief, say so for example, we're taking a 50% haircut on our dividends, right? So countries issue bonds in order to get money so that they can spend on infrastructure, etc. And those bonds need to be serviced by paying an interest to the donors. And when it becomes unsustainable like in Mozambique, Mozambique government then negotiates with the donors to say, okay, we understand that we owe you X amount, we are going to default, we cannot actually afford to pay this money. Would you be willing to take a 50% cut on your next dividend payment? And then you know, donors will agree or disagree, etc. They might even extend the term of the loan from 10 years to 20 years, etc., which eases the debt burden on Mozambique. But it's very rare that you get a lump sum cut on the principle of debt. Because ultimately, all countries never clear their debts. Countries just want to grow out of their debt. So as long as economic growth is there, countries can continue borrowing and investing. The other question was on the state, developmental states. <laughs> is South Africa a developmental state? My answer is quite simple. There is a list of categories and I think we will attach to three. A strong state that's had a clear development plan. The National Development Plan, although is touted as the National Government Plan until 2030, it is largely a diagnostic. It does not say we are going to be doing A, B, C, D in this year. We are going to aim at achieving A, B. It does have some targets, but these targets aren't linked to where we are. A clear plan of what the government is going to do, which sectors it will focus on. So the, the National Development Plan to me is a weak plan, and it's largely diagnostic. It's telling us the problems we know. Now, secondly, you have a strong state. Yes, the government is quite strong but it's not efficient in its spending. So we lose a lot of money through state capture and the quotas and you know, poor public procurement, uh, you know, poor decisions by state officials. And so, yes, the government might have plans, you know, 
increasing child welfare grants, providing incentives for industry, but if that money ends up in private pockets, it doesn't actually generate the growth you want to generate. And then thirdly, you want a government that's insulated from private interests, the Gupta uh, is, is proof of it. And, you know, the state is far too contested in South Africa by private interests, much more than a national interest. Um, and so for me, South Africa is definitely not a developmental state. But should South Africa be looking to be a developmental state? I mean, people who have compared China with India, for example, will find that the Indian state is not strong. Yes, it does have strong planning. It's been very good at that since 1950. But it's not strong in terms of its ability to implement that plan. Because India is a federal state, and a lot of the decisions are determined at the provincial or federal level. So this disempowers national bureaucracy, and they are unable to implement plans. And then on top of it, they've got rampant corruption through issuing of mining licenses, etc. Yet, at the same time, they're the fastest growing economy. At the same time, they're an economic powerhouse. And so, you wonder, is it necessary to be a developing state? Some people say no, some people say yes. But I definitely think that we do, in the South African case, the biggest challenge is consolidating the private interest towards the national interest. We don't have a national interest. Then the last question was on feminist economics and what is being done in order to sort of measure the lost labor of women. Then a lot of uh, papers I've mentioned on or they hear bell hooks, but there are a number of people who are working specifically trying to reform economics in this, uh, in this direction. But I think um, we're still very far from actually achieving much because I mean, even if you think of the way in which the formal workspace is orientated, right? There are still companies to this day that will not promote women uh, into managerial positions with fear that they might have a baby. And so something that's fundamental and biological and inescapable is a criteria that you know, leads to women being discriminated. And also the issue of balancing work and you know, work-life balance by and large is done with the perspective of a man. So you think of yourself relaxing or at work working and the work-life balance is about that. But it doesn't really take into consideration the biological needs of women. You know, extended leave, child rearing, even if a person is working and bringing up children, that also creates much more strain than you know the conception of chilling at home, being at work. So yeah, we're still far away, but there's a lot we can. So what are the contemporary issues in political economy? What is what are political economists considering? or concerning themselves with. So I've highlighted uh, three topics uh, which are central, but obviously there are much more things that uh, political economists are, are care about, you know, even if you think of the land which etc. But by and large they're linked to these three. First thing is income inequality. Now in a in a mainstream approach, how do you deal with inequality? Right? And how do you deal with unequal pay? You always hear this thing, whether it's people advocating for a minimum wage or people advocating for capping executive income. So to say, executives and CEOs cannot earn more than a specific uh, you know, amount per annum in order to reduce inequality. Because inequality has major issues, right? Um, in South Africa being the most unequal society, inevitably, Inequality becomes a driver for crime. Question? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you if the point is in line with uh, my readings. So, uh, out of the value of readings for political economy, it says that uh, Mar uh, Karl Marx said that political economy is a science about class struggle. Does this fall under the class struggle and uh, in reference to capitalism about uh, wage uh, income inequality? Yeah, so it fits under, it is, it's very much located in the class struggle, uh, but I think it's a bit broader than that. Yes, it is about class struggle. What is an equitable wage, for example? 
how much should workers be paid for the value they create, how much should go to the capitalist for the value they generate from the capital. Right? The idea is that in a mainstream view where we just say the capitalist gets the profit, labor gets the wages, nothing is going to change, labor is going to be stuck in a structural position of inequality and you know, disadvantage. But that then breeds social problems, crime, theft, etc. And even civil unrest. But on the other hand, it also links to the mainstream economic debate, right? The mainstream economic debate of public economics, which says that, um, firstly, the mainstream believes that the, the market economy is, is governed through the price mechanism and that it's self equilibrating. What that means is, as if you remember the example I made of negotiating with a shop owner of a price for good, right? The mainstream will say, all of that scenario where you negotiate on a price is typically what happens throughout the whole economy. And effectively people agree on a price and that is what drives equilibrium. And they'll say that is the most efficient way. That for example, if government sets a price that people must pay, the market will clear. There will be people who can afford it, some people who can't, but ultimately they will clear. And what they want to say is that individuals should have the prerogative to make that decision case-by-case case basis. But that doesn't speak to equity, right? Because, yes, you might agree to a job that pays you a thousand rand a month, but that's because you don't have an alternative income. That doesn't mean that, despite you choosing to work there, that doesn't mean that that is an ethical thing to do, right? So there's always the sort of dichotomy between legal and ethical. And this issue of income inequality also speaks Yes, it's legal to pay certain wages, to gain certain profits, but is it ethical? Is it ethical for 1% of the world's population to own 50% of all the wealth? You know, is it ethical? Although it might be legal, they might have you know, done legal business to earn that money. Is it ethical? So this is, this is actually what Karl Marx was saying. So the issue, okay, so what I'm discussing here is a general topic of income inequality, right? To say political economy is trying to understand income inequality. Karl Marx says it's informed by class, right? Your class position. If you're a capitalist, you get profit. He wasn't really, so Marx didn't necessarily bring forward a solution, more than highlight the exploitation of labor. So when Marx writes his critiquing, what the mainstream says, you choose to work at this job, even if it's not, even if it's paying you below minimum wage or whatever, or it's, living, it's paying you unlivable wages. The mainstream will say, yeah, they, these people have agreed. The employer and the employee have made it, signed the contract, they've agreed it's fine. But Marx said, but that doesn't speak to the ethics of what's happening there. Because what's happening there is that the worker is being exploited. And the lower the wage of the worker, the more extreme the exploitation, even if the worker has agreed. So what Marx is saying is that what might seem to you as willingly day-to-day -day business, right, uh, is actually an exploitation that takes place. So for example, people always make this example of saying, when people are buying from informal business, you buy a bag of bananas or oranges from the side of the road, when the person says, okay, 12 rand for this bag. Ha! 12 rand. I want to pay 5 rand for it. But when you're at ShopRite, you're not going to be arguing with the teller when they tell you that that bag is 12 rand. But that speaks to the bargaining power that you have and the exploitation that you're putting the informal trader in. Right? So, what we're saying is this might seem that yeah, someone's actually just supporting informal business, etc. But you're actually exploiting the informal business in a way that you would never be able to exploit a commercial enterprise. And so what Marx is saying is this is both a class position and also your bargaining power is linked to your class position. All right. Then, um, so the issue of income inequality is only solvable or can only be understood or resolved through a political economy approach. Because if you're a mainstream person that says economics is all about individuals satisfying personal interests, 
and that they should be left to determine amongst themselves what is the most optimal and agree and move on. You're not going to deal with the issue of equity or equality. And so only through political economy can you actually resolve the issue because it's fundamentally a moral problem. The issue of ethics, whether you can apply. Remember, we spoke about the utilitarianism versus the Kantian ethics. And the Kantian ethics says, this thing, you have to accept it for yourself, and you also need to be applied universally. And so only through that type of ethical framework can you see a problem with exploitative labor practices, with exploitative wages, etc. This is why political economy is important. Gender equality is another issue. Mainstream will say, well, you know, women can get an education and get a job at whatever factory or company they want to work in. There's no reason for them to be willing to accept uh, exploitation by being at home and contributing to labor that's, un you know, that's unmeasured, etc. Uh, but only through a political economy approach can you even see a problem with that, right? Because it's problematic if people are contributing labor that is unmeasured. It's problematic if people are systematically discriminated because of a biological fact of their gender. Right? And under the mainstream, you might say, oh well, yes, you're working in this company, you know you'll never be promoted to the CEO because you're a woman. That's your choice. That's you know, you decide. And you can never resolve that problem from the mainstream perspective. So it's a political economy approach that allows you to delve into the ethical foundation, the ethical problem within that scenario. Then there's the whole world of the political economy of development. This issue uh, of debt, for example, that there's all this debt that African countries have amassed as a result of the decolonization process, needing to invest in infrastructure, etc. Is it ethical for them to be held accountable for that debt? Should this debt not be clear? Because it's the same people who are exploiting us, who have given us the money, borrowed us money, and contribute to our debt, right? And only through a political economy approach can you see a challenge in that structural relationship between the countries. Mainstream approach is, oh well, countries trade, right? They trade according to their competitive advantage. If African countries are really good at exporting raw materials, let them be. We'll contribute exporting manufactured goods because we have that capacity. But that doesn't speak to the ethics of where African countries are integrated globally, but also the position that African countries find themselves in and the problems associated with exporting raw materials. And so, all of these are some of the contemporary issues that political economy concerns itself. And, as mentioned again, why is political economy important? It's this issue, you know. Is this, uh, you know, is a, for example, a market-based approach going to resolve inequality? Can we get land reform from a willing buyer, willing seller approach? Open the question for those who want to contribute. So these are some of the things that political economy is important to try and resolve. And so questions of issues around expropriation, about compensation, etc., are based on this because we see no end in sight in the structural way in which the market reinforces current power and political position such that we need to actually resolve the fundamental ethics that the whole economic system is operating by. And that's the biggest contribution of political economy. So it's very, very relevant, even in the South African case of the radical economic transformation discussion. People are always telling you know, black South Africans, ah, forget about it, it's 20 years later after apartheid, you guys have a free education now, you guys uh, you know, should just get a job and you know, don't come off the land or through expropriation without compensation. This is an you know, attack on white farmers, etc. But only through a political economy approach can you decipher through what is mainly just scare mothering and fear mothering with what's actually the reality and what's needed for development. Any questions at this point?
future, that's what happened. <coughs> Alright, so the integration process, the idea is that the, a, the AU wants to introduce a pan-African passport. The idea is that if you're an African, you get this passport and you'll be able to travel freely throughout the continent without worrying about getting a visa, etc. without any restriction to your movement. So that's the stage in which they're trying to go to. But obviously, the first stage is reducing the tariffs, which is the easier thing to do, which will then encourage trade. But after you encourage that trade, you want people to be able to move freely. So for example, if South Africa, ShopRite, for example, realizes that they want to export to Zambia, but it's cheaper if they have a factory in Zambia, then they find out that they don't have the skills to run that factory in Zambia. With the free movement of people, after you will be able to trade, that will then allow South African firms to export labor or allow you know, foreign people from other, you know, from the rest of the continent to have their qualifications acknowledged in other countries, to have their skills acknowledged. But obviously you can see that this is a sort of long process of aligning policies and ensuring that what is a doctor's qualification in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, is sufficient to serve as a medical doctor in Mauritius, for example. So it's a step process. The first is the trade, then the movement of people, and the movement of capital. Yes. Okay, um, from your own perspective, um, do you think that it's possible for, for Africans to come together and have that Tina's is where 